Today, we have a mind-blowing lesson on how not to bring iMessage to Android. Windows Hello has been bypassed, new laws to fight SIM swapping, Proton Drive for Mac, and much more. Welcome to Surveillance Support 157, where we are dedicated to keeping you private and secure with the latest news in the past week. I am Henry from TechLore. I am Nathan from The New Oil. Today is going to be the same promo segment that you're all familiar with. Um, as always, we still don't really do sponsors yet. I know we've kind of toyed with the idea in the past, but as of right now, we still want to keep this mostly just uh, crowdfunded. And so if you want to contribute to this podcast, keep it free and keep us doing this every week. Um, we're going to give some context or you're going to post a Q&A by the time you all watch this, which kind of gives context into our crazy schedules um, and how we're able to pull this off almost every week and why we miss some weeks as well. Um, so we really appreciate all that support. We couldn't do it without people on Patreon. Check us out down below, patreon.com slash surveillance pod. We also accept Monero, Libra Pay, and that kind of fun stuff if you don't like Patreon. I just whacked my mic. Um, aside from that, uh, no fixes from last week, so we can just dive into the highlight story. All right, so I'll take the highlight story this week. We're going to start off with, oh my goodness. So uh, Henry was right. This story is a... Uh, a lesson in how not to bring iMessage to Android. It's pretty crazy. So this comes from a company called Nothing. I think the outlet was Ars Technica. And it says, Nothing's iMessage app was a security catastrophe and taken down in 24 hours. So Nothing Chats, which is a chat app from the Android manufacturer Nothing, it says upstart app company Sunbird, I guess it was a collaboration between the two, brazenly claimed to be able to hack into Apple's iMessage protocol and give Android users blue bubbles. Ars Technica immediately flagged Sunbird as a company that had been making empty promises for almost a year and seemed negligent about security. The app launched anyway and was immediately ripped to shreds by the internet for many security issues. It didn't last 24 hours before Nothing pulled the app from the Play Store Saturday morning. The Sunbird app, which Nothing Chat is just a reskin of, has also been put, quote unquote, on pause. The initial sales pitch for this app, that it would log you into iMessage on Android if you handed over your Apple username and password, was a huge security red flag that meant Sunbird would need an ultra-secure infrastructure to avoid disaster. I'm sure many of you picked that up as while I was reading that. Instead, the app turned out to be about as unsecure as you could possibly be. Still quoting Ars Technica here, by the way. They go on to say, how bad are the security issues? Not only was the app not end-to-end -end encrypted, as claimed numerous times by Nothing and Sunbird, but Sunbird actually logged and stored messages in plain text on both the error reporting software Sentry and in a Firebase store. Authentication tokens were sent over unencrypted HTTP, so this token could be intercepted and used to read your messages. 9 to 5 Google's Dylan Rousel investigated the app and found that in addition to all of the public text data, quote, all of the documents... Images, videos, audios, PDFs, V cards, etc. I don't know why my eyes are watering. Um, sent through nothing chat and Sunbird. It's really are sad. <laughs> it's so sad. Oh no. Why did they get security so bad? All the documents sent through nothing chat and Sunbird are public. Rousel found 630,000 media files that are currently stored by Sunbird, and apparently he could access some of them. Sunbird's app suggested that users transfer V cards, which are virtual business cards full of contact data, and Rousel says the personal information of 2,300 plus users are accessible. Rousel called the whole fiasco, quote, probably the biggest privacy nightmare I've seen by a phone manufacturer in years, unquote. I'm going to round this off from Ars Technica. They put it pretty well. Nothing has always seemed like an Android manufacturer that was more hype than substance, but we can now add negligent to that list. The company latched onto Sunbird, reskinned its app, created a promo website and YouTube video, and coordinated a media release with popular YouTubers, all without doing the slightest bit of due diligence on Sunbird's apps or its security claims. It's unbelievable that these two companies made it this far. The launch of Nothing Chats required a systemic security failure across two entire companies. I mean, I, I think I've said everything I wanted to say. This is just a reminder. People always like to say security is hard, which is fair. But there's a difference between something is difficult and you didn't even try. I mean, there's so much to, to unpack with this story and it's all pretty, I mean, it's hilarious in a, in a very sad way. I, obviously, it's not funny. Um, I think my first thing to say is uh, sometimes when something's too good to be true, it probably is. So always think about that when, you know, there's a, Apple's never rolled this out officially and it's end to end encrypted. So how are they... How are they doing this? Well, How that was the scary part is they wanted you to sign in with your Apple username and password, right. which was a huge so, red flag. But yeah, then the idea was basically they were going to be a proxy between you and iMessage. But yeah, still not good. Right. It's too good to be true. Um, that's the first thing. And then something I'll add is like our my perspective on this as an individual is um, it stresses us out as creators because we get garbage every day in our inboxes. And part of our job is figuring out what's bull, what's not bull. 
and we don't always get it right. You know, like we're not perfect, but I'd say overall, like 98, 99% of things that we cover end up being legitimate services and projects. And so I'd say for everybody listening, just make sure you do your due, dil due diligence when you're hearing something from a YouTuber. Um, it doesn't mean everything's wrong. I'm not trying to say everyone's tr out to get you because that's not what's going on here. It's just when something seems too good to be true, make sure to double check it, make sure to fact check it, take a day or two to wait to see what people are saying. Um, because a lot of people hype on hop. Sorry, I'm mixing my words up today. A lot of people hop on hype within that first 24 hours. If you wait for the first week, you'll probably start hearing about issues right away with certain things. Um, so that's all I have to say. Data breaches. So cyber criminal, cyber criminals access sensitive health data of well talk patients, not TikTok. Well talk. And this is from the move it breach. Um, so we're still going on the move it breach. It's and been the almost a year, data. man. I know it's crazy. Just Jeez. there's always some breach that just lasts forever that we have to keep covering. Um, but it includes names, date of births, addresses, and health information of over 1.6 million people. It also includes SSNs, Medicare and Medicaid ID numbers, and health insurance information from patients. Um, it's a patient um, engagement company that works with healthcare plans to provide communications to subscribers about their healthcare. And this data breach includes no index code, which tells search engines to ignore the web page, effectively making it more difficult for affected customers to find the statement by searching for it. Next one's a quick one. The British Library has confirmed that data was stolen during a ransom attack. Uh, the gang hasn't said how much or what types of data, but samples of the data uh, shared by the gang appear to include employment documents and passport scans. The Canadian government has disclosed a data breach after a contractor was hacked. So two of its contractors have been hacked, exposing sensitive information belonging to an undisclosed number of government employees. Uh, this compromised BGRS and SRIVA Canada systems, which dates back to 1999, and it belongs to a broad spectrum of affected individuals, including members of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, Canadian Armed Forces personnel, and Government of Canada employees. And this includes over 1.5 terabytes of uh, documents leaked, as well as three full backups of CRM for branches. Next data breach comes from AutoZone, who, for those who don't know, is an auto parts retailer. Um, if you're handy with a car and you're comfortable doing it, you can go down there, pick up the parts, do the repair yourself, and save on labor costs. Uh, they are the leading retailer and distributor of automotive parts in the US, over 7,000 shops. They also have places in Brazil, Mexico, Puerto Rico. And this affected 184,000, almost 185,000 people in May of this year. The data leaked by the cyber criminals is about 1.1 gigs in size. It contains employee names, email addresses, part supply details, tax information, payroll documents, Oracle database files, data about stores, production and sales information, and more. It does not appear that any customer data was affected at this time. Hacktivists have breached U.S. Nuclear Research Lab, and it's stealing employee data. So this is the Idaho National Laboratory, which is a nuclear research center run by the U.S. Department of Energy. Attackers claim to have impacted hundreds of thousands of employees, system users, and citizens. It includes full names, date of births, email addresses, phone numbers, social security numbers, physical addresses, and employment information. Uh, definitely an interesting place to strike. Kansas courts have confirmed data theft and ransom demand after a cyber attack. So last month, the Kansas judicial branch suffered a cyber attack, which took down a considerable number of systems. They actually list them all in the article if you're curious. And at the time of this writing, I think... All or most of those systems are still down. They are now confirming that it was a ransomware attack and that data was stolen. Quote, based on our preliminary review, it appears the stolen information includes Office of Judicial Information or Office of Judicial Administration files, district court case records on appeal, and other data, some of which may be confidential under law. Healthcare startups scramble to assess fallout after post-meds data breach hits millions of patients. So this is an update to a story from last week. So stay subscribed to surveillance support because we're probably like one of the few people that are going to keep sending you updates to things so you keep them in the loop. So you stay in the loop on these things. But uh, TruePill wasn't the only one affected by an attack. Their parent company, PostMeds, was as well. The article doesn't mention any conflicting information, but this does raise questions if other subsidiaries got hit as well. Maybe we'll find out more next week. All right, with that, we'll move into the company news. First up, YouTube says new five-second video load delay is supposed to punish ad blockers, not Firefox users. I'm pretty sure we covered this one in the past, um, but if we didn't, or if you guys forgot, so there was rumors going around that um, if you were a Firefox user going to YouTube, there was a five-second delay whenever you tried to watch a video, and there was a lot of theories going around that YouTube was trying to punish people who are using Firefox to try and like get everybody back onto Chrome. Google is now basically countering that narrative and they're officially saying like, no, 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 we, uh, we're, we're not trying to 
punish Firefox users specifically. We're trying to punish all ad blocker users, which is messed up in a different way. But yeah, that's that's kind of the whole story. I don't know, the, the guys from 404 Media were not able to like replicate this issue regardless. So it's also possible it's like an A-B testing thing. Maybe some people are seeing it, some people aren't. But uh, they said that there's enough people posting about it and like some people have even posted like video of it that it, it seems believable that it's happening to some people and not others. So um, yeah, that's kind of all we got right now. That really sucks. T-Mobile is sued after an employee stole nude images from customer phone during a trade-in. This is similar to at least eight others levied against T-Mobile in the past, according to new records and news reports. So we've actually covered a story like this on surveillance report in the past. I think it was a Samsung device, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And it's also happened, I think, with Apple once. Yes, Apple I remember that. But those repair. ones... Um almost identical the only real difference is they sent those in for repairs this was an actual trade-in to get a new phone keep in mind <laughs> what is on your phone when you're getting rid of your phone or yeah. giving it to someone to repair um that's one area where i think cloud-based stuff can be nice if you can just sign out of your accounts on your phone and then reset them. yeah yeah um or you just have backups locally whatever you need but um it, getting into the story um it, they pretty much uh, the suit accuses t-mobile of failing to properly train its retail workers and turning a blind eye when employees use their access to steal customer data under the guise they're helping them with repairs and data transfer t-mobile uh shifted the blame a little bit and said this was an employee of a third party authorized retailer and he was terminated while we were unable to comment on the specifics of this case we went to we want to underscore that we take customer protection and issues like this very 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 seriously um, and they have policies and procedures in place to protect customer information and expect them to be followed coming from t-mobile uh, interesting statement um, the victim who was only referred to as jane doe in the complaint states she went to a t-mobile store to upgrade her iphone xs max to an iphone 14 pro max and while there she handed the old device off to an employee so he could transfer the data to the new device and while the worker had the phone he found nude images of the victim and a video of her having sex with her partner on the camera camera roll of the XS Max and sent it to himself on Snapchat. Once the transaction was finished, Jane assumed her data was wiped from the old phone until later that evening when she checked her Snapchat and saw that the images had been sent to an unknown account, which police later traced back to the T-Mobile employee. During that time, Jane was seeking assistance at the T-Mobile store, and the unauthorized person continued to log into her accounts on the iPhone XS Max. At first, staff claimed there had been no trade-ins that day, but with help from mall security and local police, Jane's old phone was found in the back room. Rather than helping Jane out in the face of the sexual privacy crime, the T-Mobile manager said if Jane wanted access to the old device that had been weaponized against her, Jane would need to pay them the amount that they had discounted for her, that they had discounted her for the trade-in. So... Really bad situation. I feel really terrible for this person. I would, can't imagine if this happened to me. Um, I would just feel terrible about this, um, especially for their partner. <laughs> that that just seems terrible um, because it's not something that they had full control over. Um, I would say for those listening, um, if you are, best thing to do is to not record stuff like this in the first place. But if you are going to record something like this, I'd suggest keeping it in a safe place, not on your devices, um, you know, like a flash drive or just something you can access securely. Um, and be very aware if you're getting rid of the phone, especially that you're actually getting rid of it and you reset your devices. This it just blows my mind how like complicit everyone is or was in this story, like on the company side, like at first staff were like, oh, we didn't have any trade-ins that day. And they had to go and get the police involved and pull the security cameras to be like, bro, I was here. Oh, here it is in the back room. And they're just, you know, like, okay, you want it back? Well, you're going to have to pay for it. It's like. That just, that is such a corrupt store from top to bottom that like everyone was, the manager was in on it. It just, oh my God, that level of corruption blows my mind. Okay, it was actually kind of a light week, probably because of the holidays. And uh, we're gonna go into research now. This next one is interesting. It says Microsoft's Windows Hello fingerprint authentication has been bypassed. So this was done on three different laptops, a Dell Inspiron 15, a Lenovo ThinkPad T14, and a Microsoft Surface Pro X. So even Microsoft can't get their own stuff right all the time. Security researchers have discovered multiple vulnerabilities in the top three fingerprint sensors that are embedded into laptops and used widely by businesses to secure laptops with Windows Hello fingerprint authentication. The team identified popular fingerprint sensors from Goodix, Synaptics, and Elon, E-L-A-N, as their e 
Elan, I guess, as targets for their research with a newly published blog post detailing the in-depth process of building a USB device that can perform man-in-the-middle attacks. Such an attack could provide access to a stolen laptop or even an evil maid attack on an unintended device. So quick pause there. We always want to point out with these kind of attacks, this one does require physical access. And uh, we're going to talk about it in a second. It did require some work. Researchers reverse engineered both software and hardware and discovered cryptographic implementation flaws in a custom TLS on the synaptic sensor. The complicated process to bypass Windows Hello also involved decoding and re-implementing proprietary protocols. So again, this is not something that some random script kitty on the internet is going to use against you. This is not something that, um, you know, your, your housemate is going to use against you because they're nosy unless they work for the NSA. This is pretty complex stuff. Um, we just always want to put these stuff in perspective because it's very easy to freak out. And I know there's going to be, for the record, I know there's going to be people in the comments that are like, well, don't use Windows. I, I, to an extent, I agree with you, but sometimes you have no choice. And regardless, we, sh we should be trying to urge these companies to be more secure and more private instead of just writing them off as a lost cause and saying, well, if, if you don't compile your own code from scratch, you don't deserve privacy, even though it's a human right. Also, I'm going to get off that stupid take. Box. Sorry, that's a stupid take on this story because it's not a window specific issue. It's just not like this biometric issue can be found on like we see these research articles come out about this on iOS, on Android. If there was any feature like this on Linux that even existed in the first place, I'm sure they could pick it apart as well. Sure. So that it doesn't take away from the operating system. This is a very unique issue. I just want to add that there. But anyways, we've spent a, a long enough on that soapbox. So anyways, yeah, just again, we're putting it in perspective. It is a pretty complicated attack. It does require physical access. So... Don't freak out. Um, it does work as long as someone was previously using fingerprint authentication on a device, which is probably pretty obvious, but we digress. And last but not least, the article points out this isn't the first time that Hello Biometrics have been defeated. Uh, Microsoft was forced to fix an authentication bypass back in 2021, following a proof of concept, capturing an infrared image of a victim to spoof the facial recognition. However, it's not clear if Microsoft will be able to fix these latest flaws. The researchers found that Microsoft's SDCP protection was not enabled on two of the three devices they targeted. Uh, the company who did this research now recommends that OEMs make sure SDCP is enabled and ensure the fingerprint sensor implementation is audited by a qualified expert. They are also exploring memory corruption attacks on sensor firmware and even fingerprint sensor security on Linux, Android, and Apple devices. So what Henry was just saying a minute ago, we might have some updates to this in the coming months. Politics. So a secretive White House surveillance program gives cops access to trillions of U.S. phone records. So this is known as Data Analytical Services, or DAS, which has for more than a decade allowed federal, state, and local law enforcement agencies to mine the details of Americans' calls, analyzing the phone records of countless people who are not suspected of any crime, including victims, using a technique known as chain analysis. The program's targets not only those in direct phone contact with a criminal suspect, but anyone with whom these individuals have been in contact as well. The DAS program, formerly known as Hemisphere, is run in coordination with the telecom giant AT&T, which captures and conducts analysis of U.S. phone records for law enforcement agencies from local police and sheriff's departments to U.S. customs offices and postal inspectors across the country. Call records stored by AT&T do not include recordings of any conversations. Instead, the records include a range of identifying information, such as the caller and recipient's names, phone numbers, and the dates and times they placed calls for six months or more at a time. Keep in mind, this is called metadata, and this is something we talk about all the time, and it's why we love services like Signal sometimes, uh, because they do protect that kind of information uh, over WhatsApp. So even if something is end-to-end -end encrypted, and even if they don't keep recordings and know what you're talking about, it's still important data that can be used against you. Documents released under public records show that the DAS program has been used to produce location information on criminal suspects and their known associates, a practice deemed unconstitutional without a warrant in 2018. It is not currently known how far back the call records accessible under DAS go. A slide deck released under the Freedom of Information Act in 2014 states that up to 10 years worth of records can be queried, a statistic that contracts with con which contrasts with other internal documents that claimed AT&T could reach decades into the past. AT&T's competitors, meanwhile, typically retain call records for no more than two years. So uh, maybe don't go with AT&T, and it might be a tiny bit better. Don't know.
But unlike past programs, which were subject to congressional oversight, DAS is not. Uh, a senior Wyden aide tells Wired, to, the program takes advantage of numerous loopholes in federal privacy law. The fact that it's effectively run out of the White House, for example, means it, it is exempt from rules requiring assessments of its privacy impacts. The White House is also exempt from the Freedom of Information Act. And because AT&T's call record collection occurs along a telecommunications backbone, protections enshrined under the Electronic Communications Privacy Act may not apply to the program. Earlier this month, Senator Wyden and other lawmakers in the House and Senate introduced comprehensive privacy legislation known as the Government Surveillance Reform Act. This bill contains numerous provisions that, if enacted, would patch most, if not all, of these loopholes, effectively rendering the DAS program in its current form explicitly illegal. All right, the next story is actually pretty quick. It says FCC tightens telco rules to combat SIM swapping. So the FCC has put out some new rules for telecommunications providers, including cell phone carriers, Verizon, AT&T, you know the type. Under the new rules, wireless carriers are required to notify customers of any SIM transfer requests. The FCC has also revised its customer proprietary network information and local number portability rules, making it more challenging for scammers to access sensitive subscriber information. So this article was kind of vague, and knowing the FCC, they're also probably kind of vague. They're probably like, hey, you have to implement these ideas, but we're not going to tell you how to do them necessarily. Which, we'll kind of see how this gets implemented. But at very least, this could be, um, this could be good for letting people What's the word I'm looking for? Um, for letting people know there's an issue. Because I've read stories about people who have been SIM swapped, and the only way they noticed was that they just haven't gotten any text messages in a long time. Australia beefs up cyber defenses after a major breach. So they're going to give cyber help checks for small businesses, including cyber law enforcement funding, and introduce mandatory reporting of ransomware attacks under a security overhaul announced on Wednesday after a spate of attacks. The federal government said it will also subject telecommunication firms to tougher cyber reporting rules, which apply to critical infrastructure, and it seeks mitigants to build up the cybersecurity workforce and set limits on interagency data sharing to encourage people to report incidents. Under the strategy, the government said it would set up a single portal for reports of cyber attacks and establish cyber rapid assistance teams to respond to incidents in the Pacific region, as well as identifying network vulnerabilities. It looks like this is still a proposal, so we'll have to wait to see if it passes. If you're on Australia and you want to see something like this, then do what you got to do. Contact people. Okay, that'll bring us to the FOSS section, and we've got some pretty good news this week. Some pretty exciting stuff. First up, Proton Drive is introducing their private and encrypted cloud storage for Mac. Um, not gonna lie, the, the title really says it all. There's nothing explosive here. Um, in the very last paragraph, it seems to indicate that when you currently use it, you have to create a new folder, and then if there's any files you want to sync, you have to add them to that folder. Uh, I, I don't remember if your video included this about Proton Drive for Windows, but I know mine did. Um, on the Windows client, when you sign in, you have the option to say, hey, I want to select these folders and sync them. They, they said the last paragraph was basically like, here's what we hope to roll out in the future. So I just wanted to highlight that specifically because that's kind of a bummer. But it sounds like they do know that's a thing. They want to work on it. And, uh, you know, some other stuff coming up. So... If you're a Mac user, go ahead, read the article, and maybe check that out if you're interested in Proton Drive. Next up is from Calyx OS, and they've released three new phones, which is really exciting and makes uh, their, op their ROM a little bit more accessible. So they released support for the Moto G32, G42, and G52, and previously they already supported a few other phones outside of Pixels, including the Fairphone. Um, I forgot what the other phone was, but they already had a few uh, it was other like phones a, there. It was like a OnePlus or something? Yes, yes, you're right. It was a OnePlus device. I'm going to go check right now. Yeah, why don't you check? I'll cover the story. But it's known to be fully working, the Motorola support. At this point, the main things for them to do is to work on improving the installation process and handle any bugs. So uh, they're saying that they're trying to make Calyx as accessible to as many users as possible, which is why they're trying to keep some more support for more and more devices for a longer period of time. They're relatively inexpensive, these three Motorola phones, especially compared to Pixels. And they also have much wider availability since Motorola sells phones in a lot more countries around the world. And that's why they picked those devices. I don't remember this one, but it says the... Shift 6 MQ. So it's a bunch of pixels, the Fairphone 4, the Shift 6 MQ. Quick note, no longer supported. OnePlus 8T, 9, 9 Pro Beta, Pixels 2, 2 XL, and Xiaomi Mi A2. So they used to support the OnePlus, but they don't anymore. It's cool they try to support more devices. I know it's not easy um, to port this to more devices. So that's cool. Firefox 120 ready with global control, global privacy control, WebAssembly GC on by default. So 
Um, this is an article about all the things that Firefox, Firefox includes in 120. Sorry, it's um, had a long day. Um, among the highlights, there is picture in picture mode now supports corner snapping on Windows and Linux. Support for the light dark CS color function that allows setting of colors light and dark mode without needing to use prefers color scheme media feature. So that doesn't affect most of you guys, but for the people who run websites, trust me, that's a game changer. It means a lot less code. Most notably, it includes support for the global privacy control header. When a user does not consent to a website or service selling or sharing their personal information with third parties, users can set this if so desired via the privacy and security area within preferences. WebAssembly GC extension is now enabled by default and it turns... And in turn opens up new languages like Dart and Kotlin to run on Firefox. And next month in Firefox 121, Firefox will try to ship out Wayland enabled by default for Linux. Um, so regarding this global privacy control, for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's an initiative put together. I remember DuckDuckGo was involved and I can't remember who else, but I know there was a bunch of privacy focused organizations. It's supposed to be the next generation of Do Not Track. I'm going to hope that they learned from the failures of do not track, which technically could be used as not in and of itself to track you, I don't think, but it could be used as another data point to track you. But unfortunately, as far as I can tell, it's not legally binding, just like do not track. So companies don't have to listen to this. They don't have to respect it. We hope they will, but given the do not track track record, I wouldn't hold my breath. The last story is super quick. Molvad, the VPN, is introducing package repos for Ubuntu, Debian, and Fedora which is awesome to make it easier to use Molvad on different Linux distros. Um, it'd be cool for them to have Flatpak, but aside from that, uh, this is a good move. We didn't have any misfits, but um, I guess a quick shout out to Blender, <laughs> who is under a heavy DDoS attack a few days ago. Um, I'm sure it's reserved, I'm sure it's back up now, but yeah, just a little misfit I thought I'd throw in there. And that's actually it for the week. Pretty short week, uh, nice to keep our holiday a little bit more chill. Um, today's the day after Thanksgiving and I'm like, Arr. I just, I, I woke up super late and I took another nap and it's been a pretty slow day. Uh, but now I have to get some work done and get this edited because I don't have a day tomorrow. Um, and that's it for this week. So again, mind blowing lesson on how not to bring iMessage to Android. Just instead of doing that, call, call Europe and ask them to require Apple to bring iMessage <laughs> to Android because apparently Europe knows how to uh, whip Apple into shape. Um, Windows Hello has been bypassed, uh, new laws to fight SIM swapping and Proton Drive for Mac and much more. Uh, lots of good stories this week, even if it was a little bit lighter. And again, if you like this podcast and you want to keep it going, uh, definitely the best way to do that is over on Patreon, patreon.com slash surveillance pod. Super appreciated. And also you get to join the Q&A and you also get extended versions of this. We definitely had a few things that we talked about a little bit more thoroughly in the stories this week. And if you're a patron, you'll get to hear some of those discussions and more of our opinions on things. And if not, uh, we still appreciate you listening to the podcast. If you don't like Patreon, we're also on LibrePay, and we also support Monero if you just want to tip us some uh, cryptocurrency. And that's really it. Final thing, if you don't want to do any of that, at least share it around. It is the holiday season, and we normally say, uh, if there's any stories to share with your family at the dinner table, I mean, it's the day, we're recording this the day after Thanksgiving, but... Um, just this entire holiday season, regardless of what country you're from, if you're having any dinner with your family, it's a good time to bring up stories with them, if it's applicable. Um, spread the concept of privacy and security, and of course, surveillance support. And see you all next week.